We're getting their mic set up. Uh, let me go ahead and introduce this distinguished panel. Unfortunately, we couldn't get Anthony Bourdain or Margot Robbie, um, but we got, I think that, or Selena Gomez, but we got the next, uh, the next best alternative, uh, in my opinion. So uh, sitting closest to me is Professor uh, Samuel Buell. Uh, his research and teaching focuses on criminal law, on the regulatory state, particularly regulation of corporations and financial markets. Uh, he is the recent author of Capital Offenses, Business Crime and Punishment in America's Corporate Age. It's an excellent book. I recommend everyone go out and uh, purchase it. And Sam was also the Department of Justice's lead prosecutor on the Enron case, which, uh, as he said earlier today at the time, seemed uh, like it was the biggest case of financial fraud uh, that this country would likely uh, ever see. Um, sitting next to Sam is Professor Stephen L. Schwartz. He's the Stanley A. Starr Professor of Law and Business at Duke uh, and founding director of the Global Financial Market Center. His areas of research and scholarship include insolvency and bankruptcy law, international finance, capital markets, and systemic risk and commercial law. Uh, in addition to that, he's also a renowned expert in the field of asset securitization. And next to Professor Schwartz is Professor uh, Lawrence Baxter. He is the William B. McGuire Professor of Practice of Law at Duke, where he's also my co-director currently of the Global Financial Markets Center. Uh, his focus, uh, his teaching focus in, and research is on the evolving regulatory environment uh, for financial services and uh, beyond. So please uh, give me a hand in welcoming our distinguished panel. <clears throat> okay, so a couple questions. Uh, first, uh, Stephen, for you. So the movie is, is premised on um, sort of the evolution of the mortgage-backed security market, and clearly sort of something went south along the way. So maybe if you could just sort of give us a brief sort of history of the evolution of the mortgage-backed security market and sort of when things started to go off the rails. Okay. Um, the mortgage-backed securities market started in the 1970s, and it started as a way of enabling banks to... Oh, this doesn't work? Okay. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Okay, so the mortgage-backed securities market started in the 1970s as a way of enabling banks to monetize the mortgage loans they made. And this, what this meant is the banks could sell them off, get cash, and make more mortgage loans. And this was uh, very important to home ownership in the U.S. Um, things started to go bad. Uh, about 2006, and uh, what happened was until then, home prices had increasingly uh, gone up, and everyone expected, not everyone, but most people expected home prices to continue to go up. As long as they did, then the mortgage, um, the, you know, the, the uh, homeowners could refinance their mortgage loans. But what happened it was, home prices started to decline, and uh, this led to a number of problems. I could go at great length about this and what it all means, but I will let others speak first. Well, Lawrence, maybe following up on that, sort of talk about the role of the big banks uh, in this sort of whole mess, because my understanding of the, the mortgage-backed security market is originally, um, you know, Fannie, Freddie, right, but then private label came along. Uh, the big banks started sort of buying subprime packaging names. So to sort of talk about, you know, what went on with the big banks. I know you have experience uh, at Wachovia and their purchase of a subprime lender. You know, uh, it's a classic case of everybody was doing it, which um, I think uh, focuses on a bigger picture change, not just structured finance and mortgage-backed securities, but uh, the entire American culture, I think, changed very substantially in the 1980s, 1990s, and early 2000s. Um, I think you saw it in that film, but uh, I certainly saw it with the investment banking side of our company, in which there became uh, an adulation of smart asses. Uh, and, and I say that very seriously. Uh, in other words, the, the, the faster your talk and the slicker your walk, uh, the more uh, people acquired prominence and uh, structured um, or market uh, uh, RMBS, re, um, residential mortgage-backed securities, and many other products uh, all the way across the whole spe uh, credit spectrum, while starting with a good idea, which was to recycle uh, the originating funds. 
um, became a very easy way uh, to make money really fast. Uh, and you could also, by using the credit uh, rating agencies and the way that they were used, as you saw in the movie, uh, you could sell them much more easily, too, because you could tranche these uh, securities and you could take the AAA tranches and sell them to many of the investors that were otherwise not allowed to invest in them. Um, but a classic example I think Lee was referring to was uh, what my own company did, um, I always like to add after I had left, um, <laughs> uh, which happens to be true and it's shame on me because I didn't realize what a serious mistake it was at the time. Um, we, we were in, in a cycle that I think uh, is uh, a, just a living example of Hyman Minsky's uh, thesis about the instability of, of capitalism. Uh, it was a very competitive cycle of growing bigger and bigger. We had had enormous success in Manhattan because the New York banks were so bad it was easy to actually do well there. Um, and uh, we got the reputation as um, uh, the bank that got it right with everything that they did. And uh, to some degree that was a deserved reputation. But the one thing we couldn't stand was that we were not very solidly across the whole country. And Bank of America she used to be Nations Bank um, and, and had uh, essentially uh, done an acquisition of Bank of America in San Francisco, taken the name uh, and taken control of the merger. Uh, they were across the country and they were also to the great frustration of Wachovia um, less than a quarter of a mile down the street in Chicago, uh, in Charlotte. And so um, the management there was really, really anxious to get across to the West Coast uh, and brought what uh, you know I'd be inclined to say was very dumb old timey banker um, uh, culture and thinking to the picture, and they found a uh, savings and loan uh, in o um, Oakland, uh, California, that had for many many years done very well with an extremely conservative kind of home lending business, but had and with the rise in prices that uh, Stephen talked about, had hit upon a great idea which was to develop the pick a pay mortgage. Uh, that was to say to the homeowners who had a mortgage uh, that because their home prices were rising so fast, they could decide whether they wanted to pay that month. Um, Golden West, which is the company, actually uh, thought there was nothing not to like about it because the collateral was getting better and better and better. Uh, Wachovia very, very consciously said in January 2006, we will never touch that kind of product. It has no sense whatsoever. And in May 2000 and, uh, 2006, the company bought Golden West and not only touched the product, they took it over and used, spread it across the entire Wachovia portfolio. Well, when, when Wachovia bought that company, uh, the stock price dropped about 20%. The market knew it didn't look good. Uh, and it never really recovered after that, but it was never discussed inside the company. And it was one of those classic examples of that everybody was doing it, and if you wanted to be successful, um, I think uh, John Reed had said at Citibank, if you, uh, uh, if you didn't uh, get up and, and dance, uh, when the music stopped, you'd be, you know, you'd be left without a, a seat to sit on, something along those lines, that you sort of had to do it because everybody else was. Chuck so there Prince. was a real... Uh, Prince, Chuck, uh, Chuck uh, Prince, Prince yeah. that's right. And, uh, you know, um, there was a suspension of reason. There was a belief that this go-go slick culture somehow was a winning culture. I've got a theory that it's all started with re reality TV, that that will take us down another road that I don't want to go. <laughs> okay, so let me get Sam in, in here. And, and, and in the movie, Sam, you know, the word fraud is used quite a bit. But obviously at the end, you know, they kind of sarcastically make reference to the fact that only one banker, sort of low level, went to, went to jail for for any of this stuff. And you've written uh, extensively about this. So sort of give us your take on kind of the difficulty uh, in you know, pressing criminal, ch criminal charges when it came to a lot of this, this um, fraud, I guess, is you know, the term that comes to mind, really. Well, I think you know, there's two ways we use the word fraud. One is in a colloquial kind of way, and the other is in a legal way. They're not you know, exactly the same, especially when you're talking about criminal law, where the government has a very high burden of proof and you know, the law is more specific in terms of what it requires. So, you know, there is a colloquial sense in which the American people were defrauded by this market uh, because the banks, uh, the banks, you know, sold an idea essentially to people about housing. 
uh, and uh, and so you know, but that's different than you know. Can we point <coughs> to a particular transaction in which a legal theory of fraud will fly, and particularly will fly in a criminal proceeding? So. You know, it's it's difficult to show, for example, that any individual homeowner who was sold a mortgage product was defrauded. Um, it's difficult to show that any uh, individual investor who may have had their money in a pension fund or or an index fund was a party to any of these particular securitization transactions that were that involved the MBS products or the CDOs or the CDSs. For the most part, when the banks were dealing these products, they were dealing with each other. And in that context, the law of fraud generally says that, you know, arm's length parties in a market for an investment product don't have a fiduciary duty to each other. So in the absence of a provable explicit lie, um, there's, you know, there's there's not a very good theory of fraud. And most of the problem in these transactions wasn't outright lies, it was non-disclosure. It was the f failure to advise the party on the other side of the transaction, you know, this might not be a very good bet for you. Uh, there are risks here that you're not looking at, or our bank is actually more skeptical on these products right now than we're saying as we offer them to you today. And the law doesn't require those kinds of disclosures in, again, arm's length uh, markets for financial products. So the, the products themselves were perfectly legal. And that might have been part, part of the problem. So you're selling a perfectly legal product. And if you're selling a perfectly legal product, in the absence of a proof that you're lying about what that product is, um, particularly if you're making lots of boilerplate disclosures as you're selling it about risk, which are standard in these transactions, as Stephen can speak more to the kinds of representations that get made in these deals, um, you're, you're making boilerplate disclosures about risk. You're warning the, the other side. Um, there is a certain uh, fervor for these products that takes over in this market where, frankly, there's an incentive uh, or a lack of incentive for people to really dig into these products and ask. I mean, the movie showed how there was this small um, a cabal of short sellers who sort of got onto this and started doing the digging. But I mean, I think part of the point the movie was making was that 99% of the market wasn't doing any digging. They weren't doing their diligence. They weren't looking behind the products. They weren't actually digging into the mortgages and seeing what the quality of these things were because the music was playing and everyone was making money. So, you know, let's, let's keep dancing. Um, so there, there's this kind of gulf between this sort of colloquial sense of well, gee, we were all taken for a ride, and that sounds like a fraud, to how can we take a particular deal in this market and actually show that it was a criminal fraud? And that was very, very difficult. I want to just point out two ironies about this. Um, there were two levels at which there could have been fraud. One was the mortgage loans that were made to individuals, and the other was trading of the mortgage-backed securities. In terms of the mortgage loans made to individuals, uh, banks made these loans um, sometimes to subprime borrowers, that is, those who could not, on a cash basis, repay it uh, because they thought that the, uh, again, the housing prices would go up and that the collateral would be the way that the banks would be repaid. But this pressure to make these subprime loans was put on the banks by Congress. And Congress did it not that they necessarily had bad intentions, although God I knows what their intentions are these days, but um, they did because um, they were following, in a sense, the philosophy, without knowing it, of a renowned socialist Peruvian economist, Hernando de Soto, that essentially the poor had de facto property rights that were not recognized, and if they got financing, they could do better. And this is a way of enabling even the poor to get housing. Um, and it would have worked out if, if home prices had continued to go up, we'd all be saying how brilliant this was. Um, but um, 
we have a one of the things our, our human failings is that we look to the recent past and expect that to predict the far future, and it doesn't. If there's time afterwards, I'll show how the mortgage back um, crisis had almost an exact parallel to the margin lending crisis that preceded the Great Depression. The second RNA, the first one I mentioned is about the mortgage lending. The second one is about the trading of these complex mortgage backed securities. Um, I don't think in many cases you had the sellers of these products misleading the buyers per se. That would have been a sort of misinformation. I think there was actually a mutual misinformation that the sellers believed in it as much as the buyers, and sometimes the sellers' belief misled the buyers. And if you look at many of these complex CDO deals, and it wasn't the basic CDOs, it was the so-called ABS CDOs, which was a CDO where the financial assets consisted of securities issued in prior transactions. In many of these deals, you had all these different tranches, as mentioned, the very highest, the AAA, down. And then the very lowest was called the equity tranche. And the underwriters often retained the equity, equity tranche, believing that they would make a huge profit on it. They believed that the, most, the lowest rated, the most subordinate class of securities would pay and pay a lot of money. And uh, what's increasingly ironic about all this is that almost all of the buyers in these securities were so-called quibs, qualified institutional buyers, the most sophisticated class of investors that the SEC allows to buy and trade securities completely freely without registration, without being subject to any holding periods, uh, the idea is that they can take care of themselves. So, Lawrence, talk about the role uh, or absence, really, of regulation sort of leading up to the crisis and whether or not it was simply a matter of statutory authority when it came to, you know, shadow banking is operating outside the regulatory perimeter or even, um, you know, lax regulation when it came to the Federal Reserve and their ability to sort of regulate some of the the underwriting standards. So sort of give us your perspective on um, what tools were missing or what regulators did wrong. Well, I'll start by saying that some of the enhancements, and there have been a lot of enhancements of statutory authority since uh, the crisis, with, especially with the Dodd-Frank Act that you've all heard about, uh, some of those uh, have definitely made a qualitative difference in the nature of regulation. But I also do share the view that a lot of people have that there was plenty of statutory authority to take action to stop this beforehand. Uh, the uh, regulators, of course, will always say that they were powerless. That's absolutely not true. Uh, but there was not a will to do it, nor was there a public expectation to do it. And had they tried, they would have met huge resistance uh, at the hands of Congress uh, and in the hands of the public, um, because they would be like the police officer who gets called to a great party at, at midnight and <laughs> tries to tell everybody to calm down. Uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, they are the party poopers when they try to do that. And that gets back again to this, this Minsky hypothesis. We get into a cycle uh, and we start to suspend belief. We start to believe nonsense. Uh, and so I would hesitate to point fingers at the regulators. There is no question they defaulted. They failed to do things they should have done. But I would hesitate to point fingers because we all did. Uh, we all believed in nonsense at the time. Um, I was, uh, I retired from Wachovia in 2006, and my boss retired one month afterwards. Uh, and about two months later, she sent me a deck um, that had been put together by an engineer uh, that showed that the um, mortgage market was going to collapse. And she said, what do you think? And I looked through it. I read it about five times before I got back to her. And I said, his logic looks good. If he is right, we're all finished. But I don't think he can be right. And she, as well, breathed a big sigh of relief. And that was the end of that. Of course, he was right. 
Uh, and it took eccentrics or, or people who were slightly out of the loop, like like Burry in the in the in the movie, uh, to be able to see that, or like the like the the uh, young hedge fund garage hedge fund uh, owners to be able to see that. Uh, the mainstream couldn't see it. I remember once listening to a economist who, um, to my disgust, is still making a fortune consulting. Uh, he came and he talked to us about why the knowledge economy was just different. And he said, none of the old rules apply anymore. So that, first of all, neutralizes any instinct you have that something bad is, is, is occurring. Uh, and then he said, we've solved the whole problem about economic cycles, and we live in an economy of the mind. And that's the great strength of America, that other countries haven't figured out how to be gigantically innovative like us. And so we will always be prosperous. And everybody there just sat listening. I didn't personally like him because I thought he was very slick, but I know that he was having a lot of weight. And regulators were hearing that. And when regulators did try to act, the very few of them, because most of them were just like the rest, they thought, well, it's all going to be OK. Um, and, but when the, the few that did try to take some action were very quickly rebuffed. And then they had the worst possible leadership from the top, uh, by which I mean Alan Greenspan and the Fed. Uh, so, um, in the, uh, consumer lending, where the Fed had enormous responsibility, uh, they decided it was a very low priority. Uh, of course, Greenspan talked about how uh, we were in a very different era, and he said, yes, there was some irrational exuberance in the market. But anything he said, uh, everybody took as gospel. Um, but he made a serious mistake, as he, as he recognized afterwards. But if you have the chairman of the Fed and other governors on the board of governors of the Fed uh, saying these kinds of things, it's kind of reassuring for everybody else, and it's very difficult for other regulators to start bucking the system. No excuses, and that there are times when we should buck the system, so, but we don't. And uh, But I, I think it's just not true that they never had the power to stop this. I just think dynamically they couldn't stop it. Not, not I'm just curious true. what you think, Lawrence, about this. I mean, it seems that there's two things we're talking about that are a little bit contradictory here. You know, on the one hand, there's this sense that uh, there was this kind of inability to see what was obvious, um, and the suspension of disbelief and the belief in sort of a new model or that you know gravity didn't exist anymore. On the other hand, there was this also, it seems to be, this sense that um, there was something going on that couldn't last, um, and that you know, as long as the music kept playing, we all had to keep dancing. And you know, maybe it's that there was a period, maybe what I'm talking about is something that transitioned in, in, at a certain point, and I don't remember the chronology well enough to say exactly what that point would be, but I, I mean, I feel like there, were, there was a point at which, you know, well before the collapse when, when um, you know, it, it was not a well-kept secret that there was something wrong with the housing market, oh, yeah. that this couldn't continue. In 1987, I remember the Wall Street Journal was writing about it. Um, but what was happening is we were looking at facts being reported and I think wishing it would go, somehow there were smart people who would figure this out, which I think is, is implicit in all bubbles. Right. But uh, you're absolutely right. And there were also prognosticators uh, who were very clear that we were heading for a disaster. Noriel Rubini gets a lot of. Right. The only thing I'd say about that is that there always are prognosticators who, like, you know, even a broken clock is twice, two times, as right twice a day. Uh, that's not to take away from what he said, but, you know, he's gone now. He's made other prognostications and nobody can remember what they were. Um, and, and I think we saw. You make enough and you get some right. Yeah, you're going to get something right. But you're, you're absolutely right. It was a complete dissonance. And I thought the, 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 the film in its Hollywood way, you know, overplayed to some extent the, the these guys were the only ones who yeah. saw that there was something wrong here, you know. I, I think that, that people sort of implicitly recognized that things didn't feel right, but they rationalized it away. And even within the Fed, there were those who thought that, okay, there might be a housing bubble, but if it were to sort of decline, it wouldn't infect the rest of the financial yeah, system. Yeah, it would be managed so that, down. Yeah, the, the so models that. did not uh, account for the contagion right. of, what, of what eventually did happen. So Yeah, Standard & Poor's in its ratings assumed that the housing market could go down as much as 20 percent. And uh, they did that in a worst case based on the Great Depression when housing prices did not exceed 20 percent decline. 
And uh, in the financial crisis, it turned out housing prices ended up going down almost a third, 30-something percent. So even, even if you predicted, you, didn't, you know, more than a decline, a, a, more than a stabilization, but a massive decline, you, you, you know, you, you did, could not easily predict how much of a decline it really would, you know, happen. And I mentioned before that another thing to look at this in the big picture is things like this crisis are going to happen again for sure. Um, let's compare, for example, the fall of housing prices and how that affected, you know, uh, mortgage loans with the fall of stock prices and how it affected so-called margin loans before the Great Depression. Back in the 1920s, housing price, I'm sorry, uh, stock prices had been rising continuously for about a few decades, just like housing prices in the, you know, 70s and 80s and 90s had been rising. And uh, many banks were making loans to subprime borrowers to enable them to use the proceeds to purchase stock, and then they pledged the stock as collateral for the loans. It's exactly what occurred in the mortgage crisis, where banks made loans to bar homeowners, you know, to buy homes, and they pledged the homes as collateral. When prices of the stock market started to decline in 1929, uh, the banks started to lose money, and they they started to default um, to other banks. The price of the stocks went down further, and there was a death spiral, a collapse. And uh, this, um, uh, the parallels are remarkable. And it's like a poker player going all in on one hand. Yeah. You know, everything is levered on one. Well, to some extent, yeah. Okay, so before we turn it over to audience questions, I do have, you know, one final question for you guys. We have students here who are about to enter the, the job market and have, uh, you know, 401ks and, and all that stuff. So for all of you, um, from your perspective, what has changed and what, if anything, will prevent something like this from happening again, and, you know, a financial crisis from infecting the rest of the, the economy? Well, I guess I'm, uh, I mean, I probably have the least to say about that. Um, as a criminal law person, we tend to look backwards, not forwards. But, um, uh, but I, you know, I, um, I'm not optimistic uh, in the sense that, you know, I don't know what the next, you know, crisis is built around. If we knew that, we'd be like these guys. We'd be out there shorting right now and getting ready to get rich. But, um, but, uh, but I worry about, you know, the, the basic structure of the banks, um, and, and there are other industries that we can worry about. I mean, we can worry about energy, we can worry about um, manufacturing, other industries, but I mean, just the banks, um, the, the structure of the banks has not changed very much. And yes, there are new regulations, and we can hope that those have introduced certain circuit breakers into the problem of systemic effects, but um, the basic problem of these institutions being too large and too complex to manage um, has not really changed. And the incentive at the sales level to innovate with regard to products is extremely powerful. Um, people are doing what they rationally should be doing at the trading level, which is designing new products within the scope of whatever the regulatory system allows um, that will yield profits. And that incentive has a logic of its own that will drive the innovation in financial products and will drive the expansion of these products. And, and sometimes, as in the example Stephen was talking about, the levering of these products off of themselves. And the, the extent to which senior management at these banks is capable of understanding and controlling what's going on at the sales level is something that I'm actually quite skeptical about. So I, I don't, you know, we've got these institutions that are almost too large to manage. Um, they're too complex to manage, and I do wonder, although I'm far from an expert on this, you know, so I'm, I'm not very good at speaking to what the cost would have been, but I do wonder at this point whether we would have been better um, figuring out some way to, to downscale these institutions. Um, so I've, I've been, uh, actually I have a paper I just put on SSRN 
two days ago, or I guess on Sunday, called uh, Too Big to Fool, Bill, and uh, subtitle is Moral Hazard Bailouts and Corporate Responsibility. And I look at the, there, there's a very uh, large convergence, I'm not sure that's the right word, there's a convergence of U.S. and foreign uh, regulation around the idea of stopping too big of a fail. And the philosophy behind it is that these banking institutions were so large that they engaged in moral hazard. They acted more riskily than they should. Um, and therefore, if you um, prevent them from doing that, you're going to solve the problem. But there's an assumption that their, their sort of bigness was what drove them to engage in risk taking. And I, I've looked at all, the paper looks at all the literature, and there are dozens and dozens of papers, including one by Professor Baxter, and um, that assert the moral hazard. And not a single paper, it turns out, shows any proof. There is a lot of correlation, but there's no demonstration of causation. And um, uh, I also show that the idea of this risk taking is inconsistent with a lot of the management incentives. Um, and I would argue that the real problem, or a real problem, is that we have a corporate governance structure that's followed throughout the world that misaligns the private interests of corporations and their investors with the public interest. And the problem is that, you know, if a firm collapses that's otherwise too big to fail, then we're, who is harmed? It is the public that is harmed more than the firm itself, because a lot of that injury is what they call externalized, put out to uh, Main Street through the collapse of the economy. And yet corporate governance does not require managers of firms, including these big firms, to think about the public. And even the Dodd-Frank Act that established these risk committees, the risk committees are only obligated to continue to consider the corporation and its investors, not the public. And I think until we try to figure out how to govern these systemically important firms by taking into account not only private interest, but the public interest will continue to have these problems. When uh, Lee, you had, <coughs> you'd asked uh, for some thoughts about people going into the market, and actually that is, a, I think, one of the hardest things to respond to. It's obviously the most important because the future really is all of yours uh, to solve, to clean up the mess we created. Um, but I have thought about it a lot, and it's easier said than done. Uh, the one thing that, that I would urge all of you to do is trust your intellect and instincts. Um, because the incentives are very strong for you to suspend be, uh, belief. So when you see people like that, on, uh, uh, and they were accurately depicted, they, the, the lower Manhattan is full of them. Uh, when you see them, just because they slick, don't think they really know what they're doing. As I've often told uh, students at the, at the graduate level, uh, a lot of them went straight out of undergrad, and they went straight into Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, and that they just don't know stuff but they've learned how to fake it. Yeah. And it's hard for you to accept that when you see the money that they make. You think they must know something that you don't know, but you've actually come a long way to get to where you are. And keep telling yourself that, that if, you, if, if, you, if it walks, talks and looks like BS, it probably <laughs> is. And if, you, if your instincts tell you that it is BS, you're probably right. The odds are that you are more right. However, that's the easy part. The hard part is acting on that because the incentives are very strongly against you doing that. Uh, the group think, the uh, pressure to be successful, to look like you're not a naysayer or somebody who's always looking at the negative, very strong. It's really hard to resist that. But I, I do think it, it's dependent on that kind of very uh, inner core leadership 
uh, for the future and a steady change in the culture, which some of the big bank leaders are trying to do, uh, and the regulators, which is to change the way of thinking back to, uh, it's not quite the same as Stephen's saying about looking at the public interest, but it's getting closer, which is that it's other people's money that you're messing with, uh, that there are other people's uh, employment and even lives at stake. Uh, that was not an unusual culture um, 50 years ago. Paul Warburg, uh, Seca Warburg, and, and, and I mean, the great uh, immigrant investor in, in New York, was very much one of those people, and he used to uh, say that to all of his protégés, is never forget that it's other people's money that you're playing with. Uh, my first CEO did the same thing, John Medlin. He would say it like almost once a week and always remind people that kind of leadership went sort of took a back seat for a while because it just wasn't generating the go-go profits. And the role models that came in were very bad ones for young people. Um, but if you can stay strong on that, I think you'll find allies at the higher levels, people who've been badly burned, who knew that they should have acted differently and didn't and are going to try to make it different in the future. That, that would be my advice, but I know it's easier to give than to follow. All right, so with those uh, words of encouragement, do we have any questions from the audience members? It, well, I think they went up excessively. It, it was a bubble in retrospect. The problem is that it's hard when you're in it to determine that a market increase of price is a bubble. Um, and uh, of course, the most famous bubble was in the 1600s <coughs> in Holland with um, tulip bulbs, rare tulip bulbs, where the prices went astronomical. And people, you know, some people just believed these were real prices. But in the bubble, you also have a lot of rational people who think they're going to invest. They know it's high prices. They're going to invest. And they're going to sell and make the profit. And that feeds the bubble as well. I think we don't really know the answer to that question, is my sense. Um, it's a very important question, I think. I mean, one theory I've heard is oversupply. So, you know, we. We built a whole lot of houses. That may have had something to do with it. But well, prices well, like that wouldn't drive was, the price up, though. And it was it, no, no, no. But she's asking why the prices started going down. Okay, um, yeah. Right. So certain places that were kind of the poster children of, for this crisis, you know, um, South Florida, Las Vegas. Um, these were places where the construction rates were, were, you know, dizzying. I mean, you literally could look at these time-lapse, you know, films of these houses just spreading out. Um, and, and, you know, at some point, basic law of supply and demand, right? Uh, especially if a lot of these houses are being bought by, you know, people who, like the stripper in the movie, you know, owns five houses and is buying houses to flip them. I mean, at a certain point, you know, you got too much supply in the system. So that's one theory I've heard. But I think it's always a difficult question as sort of what, so, so it's easier to explain how a bubble expands than what actually precipitates the popping. <laughs> Yeah, there also was a liquidity a glut. I mean, you had the Fed, um, you know, the, the um, banks were very anxious to make loans. Uh, there was something called covenant light. The banks were not even imposing traditional covenants in their lending. This is more corporate. And to some extent, that was because the banks found themselves in competition with hedge funds uh, that were acting very aggressively. But to the extent to which that affected the housing market, I'm not sure. Yeah. Oh, we had a question over here, I think. Yeah, uh, I was going to ask about what I thought was maybe the clunkiest metaphor in the whole film, which is like the blind woman at the ratings agency. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I was very close to what was happening at the rating agencies. Um, actually, I've been uh, I've done a lot of testimony, a lot of writing on the rating agencies, and 
they have a very rigorous process uh, through committees where people who are quite serious um, uh, make their assessment. I think, you know, I said there are, there are a couple of problems. One problem was that the rating agencies assumed that prices would stabilize and go down, but they didn't, their assumptions were not robust enough. So that's part of the problem. Um, another, well, I mean, I think that's frankly the major problem that, that occurred. And I think also there was a belief, and this is part of human nature, to believe that the brilliant so-called quants, the mathematicians who um, did a lot of the um, modeling, mathematical modeling, uh, that if you have beautiful models and mathematically pure models, that they've got to be right. But a model is only as good as its assumptions. And people do not, I think, rigorously test the assumptions enough. So Stephen, was it simply a matter of assumptions? Because the movie, to his point, seems to imply that sort of they knew that a lot of this was junk, but they no. still rubber stamped the AAA because you know, it was sort of pay to play, right? They got the fee, everyone was happy. Uh, so is it, is it really just the assumptions? Or was there something inherent in that conflict of interest that allowed them to maybe be overly reliant on these, these models, or even knowingly uh, assign ratings to, to things that they knew were not as good? OK, in my experience with the rating agencies and examining them and, and, and such, and I, I gave the keynote speech, for example, in 2003 at the annual International Meeting of, of Moody's, and I was told by the president to be as iconoclastic as I could. And I warned against, you know, this type of don't let the, you know, even a concentration of fees mislead you. And I know that, and I looked at how the rating agencies were operating. I don't think that that was a problem. I didn't see that. Um, uh, you know, people talk about the conflict of interest in terms of rating agencies are paid traditionally by, uh, by the issuer of the securities. Now, that wasn't always the case. Back in the, when Moody started, you had magazine subscriptions, essentially. And, um, but that didn't generate the money to hire the sophisticated analysts. Um, but I don't think it was, I do not think it was the fee structure that created the problem. Uh, the fees are charged regardless of the rating. Uh, you go through a whole process. There's insulated. Um, I, I think there were other issues. Lawrence? I, 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 I would disagree with you to some extent that um, the issue of pays model is a, uh, I always believe follow the money. And when you're facing competition from two other major rating agencies <clears throat> with the threat that was repeatedly given that if you didn't rate a particular set of securities at AAA, they would, they would go somewhere else. I don't think there was a conscious corruption. There wasn't a belief that, well, we'll just make up the rating. But there was tremendous implicit pressure to come up with the right answer. Now, having said that, uh, if you say, well, you know, how should it be? It's not that easy. Uh, as Stephen has said, there used to be, it didn't used to be that way. Um, it, and so you've got various alternatives. You've got government rating agencies, and we know that government literally got it so badly wrong that there would be no reason to assume they were any better. Uh, then, <clears throat> and they are subject to all other kinds of pressures. Uh, and then you've got buyer pays, and if you had that model, you wouldn't have this market. Because what ratings are essentially is a substitute for due diligence. The margins on these instruments are so small that there is no way a rational buyer would invest that much in due diligence. Which brings us to another issue, which is do we not have here um, grotesque financialization? That is markets that really have no basis for existing. And I think that's, uh, the, uh, that, is, that is, some, uh, is a facet of the problem. That you, that you have a very big uh, trading market there on instruments that add nothing to the real economy. Uh, but that's a obviously very controversial, and it, and, it, and it certainly attacks at its heart a massive component of our financial services industry. 
but I think it's a point that's never been fairly answered. And the ratings agencies do the best they can, given this model now. They certainly do have a very rigorous process. Um, but I don't think they are, uh, it's hard for me to believe they're any different from anybody else in human nature, which is they ultimately serve their paymasters. Yeah. Now, the ideal, you know, my hobby is wine. And Robert Parker is the great wine, you know, um, rating person. And he always would say, I do not accept money from any winemaker. I make my money only through my magazine, The Wine Advocate. He's a lawyer who went into the wine business. Question there? I, I, if I heard your question, you asked, what is the potential influence of the trading of Yes, credit default swap, a CDS, yeah. instead of a CDO. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so maybe talk a little bit about the, the CDS market, and that's sort of the, the instrument that the characters in the movie use to short the, the housing market. So, you know, clearly, and that was a different sort of purpose from the original intent of credit default swaps when, you know, Blythe Masters at J.P. Morgan rolled it out. So maybe talk about that, please. Yeah. I mean, credit default swaps are simply guarantees. Um, couched as derivatives. Um, so you have parties who will essentially say, I'll give you a guarantee for a certain fee. And um, there are many levels of problems, but the problem of CDS uh, uh, that really related to the recent financial crisis was the fact that AIG, a unit of AIG, the major insurance company, uh, was issuing a lot of the so-called protection on these credit default swaps. And there was a huge correlation. And when the market, um, when, the, when the mortgage market started to collapse, or so the housing market, AIG became potentially liable for such a huge amount, it would have collapsed that firm. And that was one of the largest of the government bailouts. Maybe it was the largest. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. <clears throat> one of the things I wonder about the film is 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 um, this may be more a question for you guys, but I, you know, it glorifies these shorts, but didn't they in fact magnify the systemic effects of the crisis? Yeah. Well, that and and. So you know, I mean, I'm no, you know, they didn't. They did something that was economically smart and rational. I'm not saying that it should have been illegal what they were doing or anything, but, um, but, but it's not as if they were whistleblowers who, you know, forestalled a crisis. Well, I'm not sure who they would have blown the whistle to. <laughs> but they, and they, I'm not sure it caused the crisis. I think no, but I mean, I doesn't it magnify the larger. systemic effects when you have these multi-billion-dollar? short positions that then have to pay out. I mean, it's not a hedge, not anybody's hedge, right? It's it's a, yeah. it's a something that puts the banks deeper in the hole. Well, this gets to the whole issue of whether derivatives are, are proper. And well, the idea is that a derivative is proper if it's used for hedging, but improper if it's used for speculation. Well, how do you distinguish the two? It's a problem. And I think it certainly did. The, the synthetic CDO part uh, is kind of an important component, right? So these guys, sh you know, shorted the housing market via CDS. They paid an insurance premium, if you will, right, every month. Uh, and in turn, banks were taking that premium, packaging it as a security that had a cash flow, and that was, you know, synthetic CDO. So, uh, again, to, to Lawrence's point, sort of excessive financialization, I think, uh, yeah. Really uh, played a, a huge role. So let's do. Um, it's getting late. Um, I'm standing between sort of you and fall break. So uh, <laughs> one final uh, one final question from the audience. We have one more. Anyone? Yes, ma'am. What would be the? What would what would he be? What,
Well, he wasn't trading Deutsche's stock. So you can insider trade in terms of inside knowledge of what's going on in the market. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it's an, it's an absolute business necessity is to get. That's, that's one of the, the most important elements of the markets is to find out what you think you know that other people don't yet know. Insider trading is a technical term, which is that you use proprietary knowledge inside your company to then sell or buy the stock in the company that the, that the general market could never find out. Yeah. I think that's right, Sam. You... Well, I mean, I just sort of was musing in my mind about whether there'd be any kind of a misappropriation theory around, um, around you know, if, if he's using proprietary information to Deutsche Bank as, you know, that the Deutsche Bank has to then trade on his own books. Um, but it, it depends what that information is. I mean, if it's just, intel if, again, if it's market intelligence, that he uh, develops as an expert working at Deutsche Bank, that's one thing. If it's some uh, specific knowledge about uh, positions in Deutsche Bank's trading books that he's then taking and using to trade for his own account, that would be different. But I didn't take that to be the scenario here. No, that's now, but I think you're right. It does, it will merge over. And if you are using uh, utterly unattainable information by the market for your own advantage, um, I, th I think this is more a case of just being really good at guessing what the markets are doing. And yeah. Word, a word on the street is the, is the phrase. And you see that Wall Street Journal runs a blog with that, heard on the street. Yeah. It's really an intensified version of it. All right, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out tonight. Please give a hand for our panelists. Thanks. Thanks.